Hey everybody, Ray Fix here. Welcome back to Advanced Swift 3. It's time to learn about protocol-oriented programming in Swift. At its core, Swift is a protocol-based language. Protocols can be used in a variety of ways. They provide a principal way of describing the requirements and capabilities of a type. And they can also add additional interface and implementation into any name type. In this video, you'll learn or perhaps review what protocol-oriented programming is all about. You'll build a mental model of how protocols work under the hood so that you can compare that with traditional object-oriented approaches. The quintessential object-oriented example is a graphical drawing app. Let's start with the shape abstract base class. Since you can only have one superclass, it's often necessary to combine loosely related concerns into it. Here, drawing, the draw method, and geometry, the area method, are combined. Swift cannot express an abstract base class, and because of this, draw is implemented with fatal error. This will catch implementation errors, but it will only do so at runtime. And this highlights one of the downsides of using classes. When deriving a subclass, sometimes you need to call the superclasses implementation at the beginning of the function and sometimes at the end. Sometimes you shouldn't call it at all, as in this case. Finally, since you're using a class, your shape object will have shared mutable reference semantics. If you aren't careful, this can be the source of hard to track down bugs that happen when one reference modifies another's underlying data. Using a class locks in the memory layout for all your subclasses. While this means less typing, it's really a two-edged sword. You're forced to accept all of the data and take responsibility for complete initialization of your base class. For example, here in Circle, you've been forced to accept the stored property called size which you don't really need, at least you don't need the height part of size. It might not be a deal breaker, but being so coupled with the base class is considered one of the downsides of object-oriented programming. On the other hand, one of the great features of Swift is the override and final keywords. This makes it very clear what methods are being overridden from your base class and what methods you're not allowed to override. So how does this work? If I have an array of shapes in memory, it will look something like this. Each element has to have a fixed size, and so the class has a virtual table, or V table, that allows it to dispatch to the correct method implementation. This is the mechanism that lets you deal with shapes polymorphically. You can substitute a circle, a rectangle, or any other shape type where there is a shape type. Swift lets you use protocols to achieve polymorphism. It can do this for classes, structures, and enumerations. There's no limit to the number of protocols that you can have, and you can also add conformance to protocols after the fact. In this example, you define a shape protocol. There are a number of advantages to this approach. First, it doesn't put any memory layout requirements on how these properties are stored, or even if you store them at all. Moreover, if you forget a single one, you'll get an error at compile time and not at runtime, and that's a lot better. You can define a default implementation for a protocol using extensions. These are called protocol extensions, and this is the one for area. If you are not using a fixed size reference type, like a pointer, and have all of these protocol-based models with different sizes, how can it work with a fixed size element array? The answer is that the Swift compiler creates a special type called the existential container type that holds the entity that conforms to that protocol, in this case, the shape protocol. Each existential container type has three things. First, a small value buffer that contains either the actual value of the model or a pointer if it's bigger than three words. Second, a value witness table, which is a V table, 
but it's just for creating, copying, and destroying values. And third, it contains a protocol witness table that acts like a V table and dispatches the correct method. Since you are not limited by a single prototype, you might split the concerns for the shape class. For example, you might choose this simpler decomposition with protocols. It's important to know that only the items contained in the original protocol definition get to be added as customization points in the protocol witness table. That's what makes implementations in conforming models and overrides possible. Swift is not a duck type language. Duck type languages such as Ruby say that if a type walks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, then you can treat it like a duck. Not so with Swift. With Swift, you must explicitly declare conformance to make a type conform. There are concepts in a protocol that might be listed as requirements that are impossible for the compiler to check. For example, your protocol documentation may say that a conforming type have certain performance characteristics such as constant time. The collection protocol types have these soft requirements. Protocols are more than just syntax. Swift protocols do not support the final or override keywords like classes do. This means that if the protocol changes its signature and has a default implementation, you won't be warned about it. Suppose area changed to bounding box area. Since there's a default implementation, you won't be warned that area, this area method, will no longer be called. Now let's go into the demo and get some practice on converting an object-oriented programming design to a protocol-oriented design and look at dispatch in more detail. Open the POP Demo Starter Playground in the Downloaded Materials. So open that up and to see all of the files, you can use the File Navigator and the shortcut for that is Command-0. If you do that in Xcode, so Command-0 and here you'll see all the files used in this demo and let me take you on a quick tour. So in the sources, we have a file called random.swift and this just has a bunch of random number generation utilities and we'll cover these in a future video in more detail, but just know that they're there. And go to now the demo shape class playground page. And this has a class version or object oriented version of our class hierarchy. So here we have a shape class and it has some properties, size, origin, color, fill color, and it has an initializer. There's a draw method that currently does nothing, actually has a fatal error if you try to call it, and an area method that computes the geometry. And here we have a, a actual derived class, circle, and circle uses our size property in order to store the diameter. And it does some special area. It doesn't override for area. And it has an initializer, of course, and it actually implements the draw method with some core graphics stuff. So here's a render view, and this simply draws a bunch of shapes. So here I have shapes, and when that's set, it refreshes itself. Down here, you can see the actual draw function, which just gets a context. Then it sets the background to some random color from our random utilities. And then it goes through, loops through the shapes and draws each one of those. Finally, here's some test code. It creates some random circles. So if we go to our assistant editor view, we can see this render view here being drawn. Now I have the results clicked on here so that can show and hide the view and hopefully we can see if I switch on to the demo shape playground page timeline, we see some random shapes being drawn. Okay, now our goal here is to implement this in a protocol oriented way. So switch to the page, demo starter, 
And here I have a couple of different protocols. So I have a drawable protocol that implements draw and a geometry that implements uh, size and area. And then there's a default implementation for area and some more rendering code. And that's just to save us from typing later on. We'll comment that in. But let's now create our protocol-oriented version of the drawing. So we want a circle. So first what we're going to do is we made a circle concrete type and it is conforming to the drawable and geometry protocol. And of course we're getting an error because we have not conformed to that protocol. And so in order to do so, we're going to need some stored properties. So I'll type those in. And with those stored properties typed in, then I need, uh, I'm going to do a special override for diameter. Now notice because we don't have a base class size, we can use radius very cleanly here for implementing a diameter. I could also made a setter, but I just made a getter here. Now, if we wanted size, we could do that. And now we'll write a method for computing area. And now let's implement the draw method. So let me make a little more space here. Now, if you want to cheat a little bit, you can go back to our original shape class and look at its implementation of a draw method and just cut and paste that whole thing into there. Of course, in this case, we've used center instead of origin. So I've changed that. And then in order to render this thing, we'll need a render view as before. So I could go back to the class, copy this render view as a starter, paste that in, but notice we're not using shape anymore. We're using a more directed drawable type. So I'm going to change that to drawable. And now we can comment in our test render code. And now if I look at the assistant editor, just as before, we have a nice rendered view of random circles. Now for a challenge to lock everything in. In this challenge, you will create a line type that conforms to the drawable protocol. It will have an update method that adds velocities to position one and position two, the start and end of your line. The complete instructions are available in the starter playground on the challenge page. I hope you've enjoyed watching this tutorial and we'll see you in the next one.